The glacier ice impact hypothesis proposes that an extraterrestrial impact on the Laurentide ice sheet ejected pieces of ice in ballistic trajectories and that the oblique secondary impacts of glacier ice created inclined conical cavities that became shallow elliptical basins by viscous relaxation. This presentation discusses the characteristics of glaciers to try to understand the effect of an extraterrestrial impact on the glacier ice. Beth Ann Davis, who is a senior lecturer at Newcastle University specializing in glaciology and glacial geology, maintains the website antarcticglaciers.org, which has a good description of how glaciers are formed. A glacier starts with a snowflake. Snow deposits over time are compressed into fern and then into glacier ice. In glaciology, snow refers to material that has not changed since it fell. Snow is very light and fluffy and has very low density. If the snow is wetter, it will have an increased density. The website also has articles about glacier types, glacier flows, mass balance, glacier hydrology, glacial lakes, and several other topics that give a good overview about glacial geology. If you have wondered what is happening to the glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica, this website will provide you with some fundamental knowledge. Fern is usually defined as snow that is at least one year old and has survived one melt season without being transformed to glacier ice. Fern is transformed gradually to glacier ice as the older snow is buried by newer snow falling on top of it and the density increases with depth. Year after year, successive accumulation layers are built up. Fern transforms to glacier ice at a density of 830 kg per cubic meter. In general, the ice at the bottom of a glacier has a higher density than the ice on top because it has fewer trapped air spaces. Fern becomes glacier ice when the interconnecting air or water-filled passageways in the ice are sealed off. Air is isolated in separate bubbles. Increasing pressure compresses the bubbles and increases the density of the fern until it becomes glacier ice. The transformation of fern to glacier ice is much faster where there is melting and refreezing. Meltwater can percolate downwards, infilling pore spaces, and the displaced air escapes upwards. If the snow is under 0 degrees Celsius, the water will freeze, producing areas of compact ice. This will produce high-density ice much more rapidly than in colder regions without melting. The density of pure glacier ice is 917 kg per cubic meter, but the density may be greater at the mid-depth ranges in polar ice sheets where there are no bubbles and temperatures range from minus 20 to minus 40 degrees Celsius. The ice temperature of a glacier at location X and time T changes due to advection, diffusion, and production of heat. Advection is the transfer of heat or matter by the flow of a fluid and diffusion is the movement of individual molecules through a semi-permeable barrier from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Heat production involves many different processes, such as the surface energy balance from precipitation, evaporation, and solar radiation. In addition, frictional heating, strain heating, and geothermal heat all affect the temperature of the glacier ice. Glaciers flow slowly downhill toward the sea. The sea level rises when the glacier ice is no longer supported by the land. During the last 20,000 years, the sea rose approximately 120 meters. Most of the rise can be attributed to the melting of the ice sheets that cover North America and Europe during the Ice Age. Hydrostatic pressure is calculated by multiplying the density times the Earth's gravitational constant and the height. The hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of a 2 km thick ice sheet, like the Laurentide ice sheet, would be about 18 MPa. This pressure is not enough to change the form of the ice. Ice exists in several forms depending on the temperature and pressure. The form of ice that crystallizes when liquid water is cooled at ambient pressure is called ice 1H, where the H indicates the hexagonal symmetry of its crystal structure. It is worthwhile to note that ice form 8, which exists at a pressure of 10 GPa, has a density of 1,460 kg per cubic meter. Ice form 8 is 59% heavier than an equal volume of the hexagonal ice form that we use to cool our drinks. The compression of hexagonal ice 1H from 18 MPa to the vacuum of space does not cause the ice to undergo great volume changes. However, changes in temperature can affect the volume of the ice. 
The paper titled Frost Heaving Pressure and Geothermal Engineering Materials During Freezing Process has a graph of the expansion of water with respect to temperature. This graph shows that liquid water expands as it gets warmer, whereas solid ice expands when it gets colder. At the freezing point, water molecules arrange themselves in six-sided crystalline structures that occupy approximately 9% more volume than the molecules in liquid form. This makes the ice less dense than the liquid water, and this is the reason why ice floats on water. Crystallization of water can produce great pressure in confined spaces, and this may cause the pipes in your house to burst during a hard freeze. When ice comes out of the freezer, it is typically well below the freezing point of water at 0 degrees Celsius. When we place the ice in water at room temperature, the relative warmth of the liquid makes the outer layers of the ice start to contract, while their cold inner layers remain unchanged. This creates tension between the layers, and the ice pieces break up, producing a crackling sound. The thermal contraction that occurs when ice warms up while it is still below its melting point of 0 degrees Celsius causes ice to fracture and make a crackling noise when it is added to water at room temperature. The Glacier Ice Impact Hypothesis, published in 2017, proposes that an extraterrestrial impact on the Laurentide Ice Sheet by the Great Lakes ejected pieces of ice in ballistic trajectories. The secondary impacts of the glacier ice boulders liquefy the ground and produce inclined conical cavities with raised rims that were transformed into shallow elliptical basins by viscous relaxation. The extraterrestrial impact on the Laurentide ice sheet was very powerful. Pieces of glacier ice were launched at a speed of 3 to 4 km per second with an expanding plume of water vapor. Massive pieces of ice with diameters of 20 to 200 meters crashed down within a radius of 1,500 kilometers from the site of the extraterrestrial impact. We can appreciate the immense energy of a hypervelocity impact by watching the experiments of Professor Peter Schultz, who used NASA's Ames gun on an ice sheet target. The ice sheet shatters from the shockwave of the impact, and pieces of ice of various sizes are launched at high speed from the point of impact. The saturation bombardment by the secondary impacts of ice boulders left a lifeless landscape pockmarked by elliptical scars. Today we call these scars Carolina Bays and Nebraska Rainwater Basins. 45 genera of megafauna became extinct along with the Clovis people who inhabited the area. Some of the animals that disappeared include mastodons, camels, mammoths, lions, giant armadillos, and saber-toothed tigers. Well-preserved Carolina bays have elliptical geometry, typical of oblique impacts, and raised rims that are characteristic of impact cratering. The bays are found only on unconsolidated ground that could be liquefied by the ice boulder impacts, and they are oriented from the northwest to the southeast. Extensions of the major axis of the Nebraska rainwater basins and the Carolina bays converge by the Great Lakes. The bays occur within 1,500 kilometers from the Great Lakes, which was the approximate range of the glacier ice boulder impacts. Experimental oblique impacts of ice projectiles on a viscous target produce inclined conical cavities that are elliptical when viewed from above. The mathematical ellipticity of the Carolina bays can be verified by obtaining the coordinates along the perimeter of a bay and fitting the points with an ellipse using the least squares method. The options in Google Earth are set to provide latitude and longitude of each point in decimal notation for input into a Python program. The least squares algorithm provides an image that shows how the points relate to the best fitting ellipse. The link to the Python program in GitHub is given in the description of this video below. The Glacier Ice Impact Hypothesis explains all the features of the Carolina Bays and Nebraska Rainwater Basins, including their elliptical shape, radial orientation, raised rims, undisturbed stratigraphy, absence of shock metamorphism, overlapping bays, and the occurrence of bays only in unconsolidated ground. In addition, the Glacier Ice Impact Hypothesis predicts that the raised rims of the Carolina Bays will have inverted stratigraphy characteristic of impacts, and that clasts carried by the glacier ice projectiles might be found at the bottom of some bays where the ice boulders stopped. The prediction of inverted stratigraphy that is characteristic of impact cratering has already been fulfilled. Ted Bunch and 17 co-authors published a paper in 2012 that shows the dates obtained at different depths of a single test location in the rim of a Carolina Bay near Blacksville, South Carolina.
The samples of optically stimulated luminescence were taken at 107, 152, and 183 centimeters below the surface. The layer at 107 centimeters had an age of 11.5 thousand years. The layer at 152 centimeters had a date of 18.5 thousand years. And the layer at 183 centimeters had a date of 12.9 thousand years. This clearly shows inverted stratigraphy since an older layer is sandwiched between two relatively younger layers. The prediction that clasts or stones carried by the glacier ice projectiles might be found at the bottom of some base where the ice boulders stopped has not been confirmed yet. In 2019, George Howard led an exploration of Arabia Bay in North Carolina. No class from the Great Lakes area were discovered, but this was only a relatively small bay with a major axis of 390 meters. There are still thousands of Carolina bays to be explored, and some of them may have class that were embedded in the glacier ice of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Thank you for joining me in the investigation of the Carolina bays and the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. I will continue to examine the mechanisms that made the Carolina Bays based on the principles of experimental physics and thermodynamics. My book about the Carolina Bays is available at Amazon. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified of future videos about the Carolina Bays and other scientific topics. Hey, this is AZ Cool, bringing you the Younger Dry Ice Wrap. I'm going to tell a story, a very sad story of the Younger Dryas. This happened long ago, 13,000 years ago. The Clovis people lived with other fauna, mastodons and camels, mammoths, lions, giant armadillos, and the saber-toothed tigers. Then came a comet, smashing everything. The impact was so large that it killed the Clovis people. Gone were the mastodons and camels, mammoths, lions, giant armadillos, and the saber-toothed tigers. That's the sad story of the younger Dryas. The weather got so cold from the global winter. 1200 years of global winter. That's what we call the younger Dryas. The story of a comet that killed the megafauna. The story of a comet that killed the Clovis people. The Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas. Yeah.